Hello, my name is Christopher, and welcome to the No Other Gospel channel. This is the program that endeavors to help fellow believers have a better understanding of biblical truth by exposing teachings that are not in line with the gospel and are contrary to God's word. Well, we are in the middle of an episode series about the book of Acts. And if you hadn't listened to the first two episodes, last week was part one. Um, before that, we gave a little bit of a foundation. We talked about prescriptive versus descriptive texts. Take a listen to that before we keep going. You may not follow what we're talking about in this episode because it is part two when we're talking about the Acts of the Apostles. Primarily, we are talking about the thesis statement, the book of Acts is not normative, meaning it is not normal. It is not an example to be followed. We are going to dig into that a little bit further today. And then in the future, we're going to talk about some specifics in Acts and why that is the case and how a lot of that is misapplied dangerously, really, in some of the sections, sects of church today. So we are going to um, piggyback on what we did last time which was the first thing we talked about is we talked about how the book of Acts was a narrative and uh, not an example to follow. Now, it's a, it's a narrative, um, a story, but that doesn't mean it's not scripture. That doesn't mean it's not divinely inspired. It is all those things, but it is a narrative. It is different from the poetry books, for example. And it is different from the epistles in certain, because the epistles are instructions. So there's a little bit of a difference there. And then we also analyze the name of the book the Acts of the Apostles. And that's where we're going to keep going today. So let's start with the Acts. It talks about the Acts, the actions of people in this book. And we need to know what those actions are, and then we can understand um, what our response to those actions should be. We want to see how those activities that are described, we want to see in that narrative, many people talk about how they are to be Re replicated, followed um, today, but we want to understand biblically how they are actually relevant today and evaluate if they aren't applicable in certain instances. So, you know, let's dig into a couple of the things that occur in Acts. First, there is the preaching um, and the persecutions of the church. That's very common. This is the spread of the gospel, and they've met with resistance. That's huge. There is an expansion of the church into the Gentiles, and you see that with um, Peter and where he's going, and you see how the journeys of Paul go to different places. This is the primary focus of Acts, where they're spreading the gospel. Um, you know, if, if the book of Acts was supposed to be replicated in every way, you'd go take the same missionary journeys as Paul, and, you know, that's obviously not the case. People aren't asserting that specifically. Um, they just pick and choose the things in Acts that should be replicated. Um, the other thing is um, the second part, and this also, this comes up a lot of times when people talk about Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4. Um, it describes how the early church interacted with each other. And that's worthy of study and evaluation for the church today. You know, what occurred in the church that we can uh, glean from? What are, what are their concepts? What are their under, underlying philosophies? How can we take that and apply to our culture, you know, our day and time? But again, these things can't be directly applied. What do I mean by that? For instance, is your church supposed to have, quote unquote, all things in common, meaning sharing everything that they have? Like uh, Acts 2.44, the church is described as having all things in common. Is that something we're supposed to directly apply today? You know, some people would say yes. Uh, and But if that's how the early church uh, um, interacted, you know, and we're not supposed to directly reply that or apply that, you know, how is that concept, how is that philosophy, is there something there that we can understand and apply today? Or, for instance, are, is your supposed, church supposed to meet daily? That's in Acts 2.46. Is that a command to be followed? Is it normative to understand that we're supposed to meet daily? I don't think anybody would say that. So, you know, where do you pick the things that you're supposed to follow that are um, for us today? And where do you say, well, those aren't and why? And so that's where I think people stumble and they don't really think about it. They say, we want to return to the, the um, Acts. We want to return to that early church. But then they pick and choose the things that they think we need to return to. The next category of actions or acts in the book of Acts um, 
and and this is really getting to the heart of the matter, and it's those things that the apostles did, and they include things like speaking in tongues, the miracles, the healings, the signs. You know, this is grouped into that category of the sign gifts a lot of times, and these were the signs. What is the name of the book? Acts of the Apostles. These are the signs of the apostles that were sent by God to show, this is important, to show that their message was true. The signs that were performed, the things that occurred, showed that these were messengers from Jesus himself to show that the gospel message was true to the Gentiles abroad out of Jerusalem. That's huge. And lastly, um, while not an action of one of the people, one of the occurrences that is critical in the book of Acts is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, um, you know, Acts, Pentecost, um, and often people refer to that baptism as also being repeatable, at least in some sort of context or concept or some sort of form. People believe that that anointing on a person is repeatable. We need to find that again and over and over again. Um, not just that the Holy Spirit comes on a new believer, which is traditionally what is an accepted understanding of that baptism, that once, um, that one moment when you have Jesus, accept Jesus as your Savior. So we're actually going to dig into that a little bit more in a different episode, that second baptism of the Holy Spirit. And actually, we did an episode a long while ago about that that you can find in the archives. But I think we're going to hit those points again because it's relevant to this specific topic of the Acts of the Apostles and how those are not normative. So further in the teaching today, if we can look at the Acts, we're now going to look at the Apostles. And first we should address the notion that people assert that maybe there are Apostles today that can repeat these Acts. But right from the start, we want to talk about the name of the book and remember that it's the Acts of the Apostles. The, not just any old apostle, not just any old disciple. It's the, the Apostles. That may be, seem like I'm splitting hairs or I'm jumping to conclusions, but um, this is actually the general conclusion from early church. For instance, um, um, Irenaeus at the end of the second century specifically said uh, the actions taken by these specific apostles, these are not actions that can be done by anyone else in the future. This was a biblical, uh, this was the common held view of the early church. Now, there were some aberrant movements that started to try to speak in tongues and do some other um, ridiculous things, actually. Um, I think Montanus and some others, and we, we have talked about that in the past. Um, but generally, that it was understood that these acts that are in the book of Acts were done by those apostles specifically. And then it leads you to say that then maybe these actions, the things that you read in the narrative of the book, are not replicated. At least certainly not in full and certainly not for all everybody in the church at all time today. So those are a specific group of people, the apostles that existed, <clears throat> excuse me, at that time in the early church. Um, and the book of Acts captures a specific moment in time with a specific group of people that would not happen again. And we're going to dig, we're going to talk about a few things of why that is the case. You know, why is this a specific moment in time with a unique cast of characters? You know, it should be fairly obvious if you just sit back and think about it when you look at that book there. And But people, I think, often miss this when they, they reread Acts and say, well, how can we do this again? How can we apply this? And they don't. They fail to recognize that this was um, a unique thing, and it was it's wonderful to read, and it's wonderful to be excited about how um, the Holy Spirit was sent after Jesus ascended, and the apostles sent the message, and this was spread throughout uh, the world, and the early church was founded. You know, um, they they fail to kind of people a lot of times fail, and I've done this uh, in the past when I've really thought about Acts. Unfortunately, uh, they fail to realize the real context of the book, and I think that's important. And um, Luke, who is writing Acts, he's really writing a continuation of his apostle or his um, gospel, Luke and then Acts. And actually, that those two books together make up about a quarter of the, the New Testament, and they're really influential on in how we understand the ministry of Jesus and the early church and how the gospel message spread, and, and they're pretty critical. Um, but what makes this time period different and not normal? There's a few things. First, 
Jesus had just ascended after being raised. That only happened once. It's not going to happen again. It's a unique moment in time. His disciples were with him for three years. He died. He rose. He ascended. And they waited to see what was next because that's what Jesus asked them to do. Second, and probably most importantly, this is when the Holy Spirit was given to the believers in Jerusalem. It, it should go without saying, but this was the first and only time this would happen. The Holy Spirit never existed on earth in this manner before. In the Old Testament, you read about how the Spirit moved, and Jesus said he had to leave so he could give the Helper to them. This is a unique moment in time, the one time when the Spirit was given, baptizing believers coming to earth in this way. Um, and third, uh, th why this makes it a unique moment in time is this is the initial kickoff, the the initial spread of Christianity for the first time. This is the only time where this religion basically has um, been commenced and and started and budded and blossomed. So it's a unique, I hope you understand what I'm saying. This is a unique moment of time in history. These men had been with Jesus and um, no other time period can say that. Jesus was only worth a certain amount of people for a certain period of time, three years while he was on earth, and that's significant. Remember um, when they wanted to replace Judas, um, and then they cast lots, and the to become another apostle, there was a few stipulations. And what were they? First, they had to be with Jesus. That was critical. As an apostle, you had to have been with Jesus uh, from the baptism of John, I believe it says. And second, they had to be witnesses of the resurrection. Nobody can claim that today. Nobody today can claim to be an apostle because they don't fit those stipulations. Even Paul, who was widely considered the last of the apostle, addressed this, and he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 8, that he was one abnormally born. And Jesus did appear to him in a different way, but he saw Jesus' resurrected body on the road to Damascus, thus also making him an eyewitness to the resurrection. So he actually fulfills those um, stipulations to be an actual apostle. And, and Paul further notes that he is the least of the apostles, one, saying he is an apostle, and two, defining a, a finite group of men that were apostles. So when we talk about the Acts of the Apostles, we're specifically talking about those 12 apostles uh, now, there are obviously other men involved that weren't apostles that were companions. You know, Luke was on for the journey and a number of other people, but, um, you know, Barnabas was there and, you know, other people got involved with this whole process, but this was a finite group of men. So, um, again, beyond that, this was a unique solitary moment for the Pentecost. The Holy Spirit, like I said before, was sent for the first and only time in history. When people talk about the second baptism as if we're going to have another baptism and another baptism, that is not possible because this was a unique moment of time in history. Now they might use that phrase second baptism in the Holy Spirit and be referring to other things. That's something for another time. But the Pentecost cannot be repeated. Let me say that again. Pentecost is not repeated. This makes Acts, at the book of Acts, the time of Acts, a special time that cannot be copied, replicated, repeated, or followed. The book of Acts is not normative. On a related note, this is the birth of the church. Like I said, in Christianity is only birthed once. So that, again, it makes it a unique time. It's a singular moment in history. Uh, any biblical st scholar usually says, uh, for the most part, uh, the consensus is that the apostolic age is over. And people might disagree when that actually occurred. Did it occur when John died or what have you? Um, you know, sometime at the end of the first century that would have occurred. And it, and it didn't continue. The apostles passed away and that age ended. And so logically that would mean that the acts of the apostles also died with the apostles. So that's one point. The other point is, let's think about the book of Acts in context. You know, usually when you try to understand a verse, you read it in the paragraph or you read it in the chapter. What does this verse mean? What does it say before? What's the sentence after to understand the context? You kind of have to read Acts in the same way. It's in context of the New Testament. Um, you know, if Jesus left the Holy Spirit at the beginning of Acts, 
you know, what did he tell his followers before that? You know, what was he saying to them before the Holy Spirit came? We talked about that a little bit. And if Peter and Paul were so integral in Acts, or integral in the story of Acts, you know, what did they write in their letters? Do you think that maybe they would have conveyed other things in their letters if the book of Acts was normative? For instance, you know, let's let's talk, let's take Jesus. You know, Jesus healed people with mud and he cursed, you know, the fig tree. And um, so where, and Peter saw all that, where is it in Peter's letters to tell people to do the same? If that's something we're supposed to repeat, why isn't it there? You know, the omission there is a little bit staggering. And, you know, even in Acts, Peter isn't going out and telling the Gentiles, here's a three-step program for training for you to work in miracles. It's not there. It's omitted. And that's intentional. Or take Paul. You know, why didn't he talk to Timothy about performing miraculous signs, you know, or how Timothy could heal himself or heal others. Why, why didn't he talk about that? He, he didn't. Why? Because it's about spreading the gospel. He talked about church leadership. He talked about discipleship. He talked about other training things. That's, that is what he spoke to Timothy, to, uh, to the people in Corinth. He didn't focus on signs and wonders and a lot of things that occurred in the book of Acts because they passed away with the apostles. So we must read what occurred in Acts and see if it was taught in the following letters and the epistles to evaluate where we need to have our focus. This is huge. You know, in the compendium of the books after Acts, does it really take those things and then set up a training program of how we're supposed to do? Now, a lot of that is invented today by people giving you, you know, you could sign up for their three-part class and pay a thing or go to a conference and learn how to do all this, learn how to do these things that they see in Acts, and yet it's not taught in the epistles. There's the narrative, which is describing what happened, and, and the teaching, the prescriptive text, but the prescriptive text doesn't instruct us in these manners. And that is huge. If the assertion that the book of Acts is normative, then it must be reiterated elsewhere. As such, we must analyze the book of Acts in that lens and realize that the book of Acts is not normative. It's not a prescription uh, to follow. It is a unique set of circumstances, a unique group of characters, in that moment in history, yes, it is scripture. Yes, it is God breathed. And yes, we can learn things from it, but we shall be very wary of directly applying and try to repeating the things that we find in the book of Acts. And that is the issue. And yet we continue in today's church age to try to do things that we're not supposed to be doing and focusing things our attention on places that we should not, rather than focusing on the gospel, spreading the message of Jesus Christ, not through signs and wonders, not through some, you know, great smoke and mirrors, not through some uh, encounter or emotional experience, but through the convicting word of God. Well, that's where we're going to end it for today. We will dig into some other details, like I said, that support this, that stem off of this tree. And this is part two of that, and that of the book of Acts is not normative. And we will come up with a few other topics that fall under this umbrella. But until next time, may your life be governed by the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ each and every day. Amen.